Joining us now, good friend of the show, Oren Cass of American Compass. Oren, it's good to see you, man. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So, Oren, you've got some new interesting data around workers and a survey of American workers, their preferences, how they're feeling right now. Let's put it up there on the screen. I found a lot of really interesting stuff here. Not what they bargained for in this survey. What did you find there, Oren? Well, we went out and surveyed a lot of American workers to ask their attitudes about really organized labor. You know, I think this is obviously a hot issue right now from Amazon to seeing increasing number of strikes. And, and there's a sense that workers should want unions. They, they, they should want some more power. And yet mostly they don't like unions. You know, mm -hmm. only, only about one in eight actually voted for that union at, at the Amazon warehouse in Alabama. Uh, and we wanted to understand why. And, and what we found is, by and large, workers hate the politics. They hate how politicized unions are. You know, the, the organizers at Amazon famously had, had Stacey Abrams signs right. out front. Um, and, and so, you know, they say by more than three to one, they'd much prefer a union that only focuses on workplace issues over mm. one that's also involved in politics. And when you ask them about particular issues, we actually we went to the, the SEIU and the AFL-CIO websites. We just took all their different political issues and, and put them all in front of workers and said, hey, check off all of the ones you'd like to see a union working on. And not a single one got even 50 percent. Most got 20 percent or less. So workers want one thing from a union or, or some sort of representation. They, they want help in the workplace. And yet you've got big labor out there basically just fighting campaigns for the Democratic Party. It's it's hmm. a real problem. Hmm. You know, I want to talk about the, not contradiction, but the difficulty here, which is that labor unions didn't start out as merely in the pocket of hyper-nationalized political issues. They got engaged in politics because if you're looking at these workplace issues, minimum wage, OSHA requirements, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, they're political and it's the state actually working on behalf of workers hypothetically. So how do you think it's possible that unions could be, or any type of representative organization, could be less political, capital P political, but still actually get things done and leverage its relationships with the state? Yeah, I, I think it's a really important point. And it you know, goes back to Samuel Gompers, who was, was one of the original great organizers in America a century ago. You know, he was actually really opposed to using the political process. He said, look, the more that we go to government and say, hey, please do these regulations for us, please, you know, impose minimum wage and so on and so forth, um, that that really weakens unions, that that weakens the, the ability of workers to actually be acting on their own behalf and, and negotiating with employers. And so, you know, that's not to say that that we shouldn't have employment regulation. I think I think we need it. I, I think we should have a minimum wage. But but it is to say that we've gotten into this sort of vicious spiral where uh, as unions become less and less powerful and relevant in the workplace, they turn around and say, OK, well, then we'll go try to be powerful in Washington. And, and yet the more they try to be powerful in Washington, the, the more than people turn away from them in the workplace. And right. so, you know, in, in my mind, I, I think conservatives need to sort of take some of the blame here as well. Uh, conservatives should should want to see workers have power. They, they should want to have workers acting on their own behalf, negotiating with employers. But, but a long time ago, conservatives sort of decided, well, we'd rather just sort of see labor die out. And so as, as conservatives have fought against labor, that has also been made labor much more just just an instrument of, of progressive politics. And so, you know, I, I I think it's a tailspin we can pull out of, but 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 we have to acknowledge that that we're in the tailspin to begin with. Right. And I guess, you know, the obvious point here, Oren, is that many workers do want collective bargaining. Um, and you're seeing that everywhere, which is that we see an explosion right now of people quitting their jobs. I think there are 60 some thousand workers currently on strike right now. When Crystal gets back, we're gonna be covering the developments with John Deere, which is one of the biggest ones within the UAW. So it's not that the workers themselves don't want to exercise their power. What does your survey show in terms of the want of many people who are workers to collectively come together and use their power for better conditions? 
Yeah, that's a great point. And, and that's something we really wanted to delve into in the survey, because, you know, in America, it's sort of like, OK, you either vote yes for a union or no for a union. That's that's the only question you get asked. And and what we found is that if you ask sort of, you know, what sorts of representation do you want? What 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 activities would you want to see an organization doing for you? There's there's a tremendous amount of enthusiasm for, like you said, for collective representation, for for bargaining, some sometimes over wages, but a lot of times it's it's not even as much about you know the wages and hours as much as it's about just having a voice in the workplace, mm-hmm. have, being treated as equals, um, feeling like you have a representative who can speak on your behalf. Uh, and then there's a, also a lot that I think unions can do and that they do in other parts of the world that we just don't think about as much here. Things like training, things like providing benefits. Um, there's there's just a ton that workers need in the mar- modern labor market and and that they that they know that they need and that they want. But if they're told, you know, either you get this radically progressive group that you, that you have to give money to uh, or you get nothing, uh, that's that's not really a fair choice. And and so I think, you know, I just saw it was a couple of days ago, the SEIU came out and endorsed um, packing the Supreme Court. Mm-hmm. It's like, well, like, well, well, what are you supposed to do with that? How how is that possibly something that that you're taking out to workers as as the reason they they should vote for you? Um, and and so I think if if we actually think more creatively and and we start by saying, look, worker power is a good thing. We want workers and employers to be able to bargain on equal terms. Um, and and whether you're whether you're on the left or on your right, that's on, on the right. That's what you should want. Uh, it's it's a lot better than having having to have government do everything. Uh, and it's what workers say they want. But to make that a reality, we're also going to have to have to be willing to say, look, this big labor model of of having the real point be to support Democratic politicians who will then turn around and support big labor. That's that's just a broken model. And, and it's really leaving workers out. Hmm. Orrin, could you speak to the newsy narrative part here, which is we've got these two big phenomena. One's the great resignation. So workers are quitting jobs um, in, in, in real mass. And then two, you're also seeing shortages of work relating to increased wages and real, you know, every, every once in a while there'd be a McDonald's $17 an hour in rural South Dakota post through go viral. How are these phenomenons at an individual level playing into the broader conversation around worker power and even just like representation in general? Well, I think it shows a couple things. One is, you know, it shows that worker power matters. I mean, I, I think especially on the right of center, there are a lot of people who sort of dismiss the whole idea of worker power and say, look, you know, markets are great and everybody gets paid exactly what they're worth. And, and one thing that that you notice in, in a situation like this is, no, actually, it, it really depends on 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 who has the power, on whether employers have lots of options and, and can offer worse conditions or whether they're really struggling to find workers, at, at which point they're really going to have to treat them better and, and offer them more. So, you know, one thing I think it's important to recognize is just when workers have more power, we we get better outcomes for workers, and, and that's something we should want. Um, the second thing, though, that, that I think is really interesting is, is to see kind of the broader breakdown that's going on here, where in, in a system that workers don't have collective representation, that that, that they can't sort of constructively go and, and work with management on, on arrangements that's going to work for everybody, uh, you can really just sort of see things break down. And, and so it actually, in, in, in a sense, is, is a, a reminder of back when we created organized labor in the first place in, in our formal laws uh, during the Great Depression, yep. where you had real strife, you know, violence, um, and you, you go look at the, the sort of preamble to the Wagner Act, which is the American labor law, and it talks about you know needing to to reduce bloodshed and, and things like that, and and so I think it's important to recognize that this is one of the things that brings employers to the table is when the labor market just isn't working at all. And you'd say, gosh, you know, unions like we had them in the 20th century, those were really important as as a remedy to just essentially a total meltdown that that we had early in the century. And this time around, I think it, it's a very different situation. But there's a real parallel. We're seeing that there are real problems in how our economy is operating, in how our society treats workers. And just saying, well, the market's going to take care of it is is clearly not the case. And yeah. so I think it's a real it's a real opportunity, again, for a constructive discussion. OK, what what institutions can we build? What structures can we put in place 
that are going to give workers the voice and representation that that they want and, and that they deserve, that they should have. Um, and, and that ultimately, yeah, it's going to be a lot better for them. But I think enlightened employers are, many of them are starting to recognize, gosh, this might might be better for us too. Really excellent point, Oren. We really appreciate you joining us, man. Uh, people can find out more about American Compass at americancompass.org and at your Twitter page and more. Uh, great friend of the show. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for coming. Thanks so much for having me, guys. Absolutely. Thank you guys so much for watching. We really appreciate it. Um, Crystal, uh, you know, we wish her the best. I think everything is going to be fine. Marshall, very happy for you to come and sit in with us. We really appreciate it. Um, we can find us more at the Real Life Podcast. You want to give the uh, the plug here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, terrible, terrible right. pivot. Like, seriously, <laughs> Crystal, um, hope um, everything's going well for you, and it's always a pleasure to sub in for you. But yeah, um, you should go check out Sagar and I at The Realignment. It's uh, basically a long-form version of what we're doing here. We have a really great time with each other, and uh, it's really great to keep building out the broader uh, cinematic universe here. There you go. And if you guys could support us, we really appreciate it. As you can see on these beautiful 4K cameras that we have here, it costs money to run this show. And so if you can become a premium member today, we greatly appreciate it. It helps us run the show. It helps us not care whether YouTube demonetizes our segments or not, which producing these wild swings in revenue. We have big bills to pay, but more important, we have big plans about things that we're going to expand, more people to hire, bigger expansions for the midterms, and more. We want to make this the number one source for news, and that's the only way we're going to be able to do it. So thank you all so much for your support, and we will see you all next week. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching. That's right. Just as a reminder, you can become a premium subscriber today. Watch the full show completely uncut. Our reactions to each other's monologues. You get to listen to it. You get to ask us questions. All that good stuff. Link is right there in the description or at breakingpoints.com. Best of all, great way to say screw you to the mainstream media.